Good afternoon. My name is Fred Phelps, and I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Association of Social Workers. I have the honor today of welcoming you to uh, this first of three-part webinar, ser webinar series, sharing the findings and implications of a recent Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse Research study entitled Canadian Youth Perceptions on Cannabis. Today's webinar, What Youth Think About Weed, is a collaboration between the Canadian Centre of Substance Abuse and the Canadian Association of Social Workers in celebration of National Social Work Month. Today we have over 300 res registrants connecting from every part of Canada, and we are tremendously fortunate to have, have both Katie Fleming, a knowledge broker at the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse, and Daniel Daycomb, a rehabilitation counsellor with the Addictions Foundation of Manito Manitoba, to present to us today. In terms of process of this webinar, the webinar presentation will be approximately 45 minutes, followed by a 15-minute question and answer period that I will moderate. During the presentation, I really encourage you to type in your questions at any time, and I'll begin to, be, begin to ask them after Katie and uh, Daniel's presentation. Please note that the recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint will be made available on the CSW website for viewing in the new, near future. Now, without any further wait, again, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome Katie and Daniel to present to us today. Katie, take it away. Thank you so much, Fred, and thank you to everyone who is joining us today. This uh, whole entire process with uh, collecting this data and writing up this report and disseminating the findings has been very informative and exciting, so I'm really happy to be here to, to share these findings with you all. So as mentioned, I'm from the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse, and we are a not-for-profit organization that has a national mandate to reduce the harms associated with substance use among Canadians. We are based in uh, Ottawa, but we do have national representation, and we were created out of uh, an act of parliament. We have a um, variety of priority, priority areas um, that we focus on, and specifically related to this research will be our priority areas on cannabis and uh, children and youth. And just to give a little bit of background with regards to the, the prevalence of cannabis use amongst, amongst youth in Canada, uh, based on statistics from Stats Canada, we know that 21% of youth aged 15 to 19 reported past year youth in 2015. And when we think about this from a world-wide uh, scale, Canadian youth uh, have one of the highest uses of cannabis worldwide, so they come in second when compared to, to France. And we know that this is uh, quite concerning as there are high numbers of youth, cannabis youth, and youth are at increased risk for the harms related to cannabis use because of the fact that their brain is still developing. And we know that research has shown that youth have many misconceptions about the risks of cannabis and that this, these misconceptions actually affect their, um, their risk of engaging in substance use. So we wanted to gain a little bit of a better understanding of what some of these misconceptions or um, perceptions were. So a research colleague and myself actually traveled across Canada last year to conduct focus groups with youth um, ages uh, 15 to 19 to gain a better understanding of, of what these misconceptions were. Some of the questions that we asked them were, around the factors that influence their decision to, to use or to abstain from using cannabis, uh, what they perceive the dangers of cannabis use to be. It was interesting because we conducted this uh, data right after the Liberal government took power, so we talked a lot about whether or not cannabis should be legalized. And we spoke about the impacts that medical cannabis has on one's decision to use cannabis as well as the impact of social media and what can be done to prevent cannabis use among youth. Just going to focus on a little bit of the more research and, and technical um, aspect here. So as I mentioned, we traveled across Canada. We spoke with 77 youth in approximately 20 different groups. So we conducted groups in Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Nova Scotia. These discussions were based on um, 
semi-structured questions, as I previously mentioned. We really wanted to listen to what youth had to say, so a lot of the questions would be open-ended, asking their, their views, their opinions, and um, we provided some debrief after the focus groups to actually provide them with some accurate information on some of the things that came up that were to us a little concerning that they should be aware of the actual evidence behind it. And as I mentioned, some of the uh, discussion guide topics included the following. Um, some of the really interesting things that we will get into in a moment will be around the reasons youth use cannabis, uh, the reasons that they don't use cannabis, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about the prevention efforts and the implications that these results have um, from a practical standpoint. So I'll focus a little bit more of uh, my time on why youth indicated that they, that they use cannabis and why that they don't use cannabis. And uh, Daniel is going to actually speak to how he uses some of these misperceptions and, um, and opinions to inform the work that he does with youth. So when we spoke to the youth about their reasons for, for using cannabis, um, the, main, the main theme that came up was their peers and family. So a lot of them indicated that they would use because they wanted to fit in with those around them, uh, looking for a certain type of identity. Another really interesting point that came up was around parents and whether or not parents approved of the behavior or disapproved of the behavior. So some youth told us that they actually engaged in substance or cannabis use because their parents didn't disapprove of it. So whether that was um, they told them that it was okay or they, they didn't receive like punitive um, punishment afterwards or that they actually engaged in cannabis use because their parents disapproved. So they did it out of an, an act of um, rebellion. We heard from a lot of youth that they actually use cannabis out of um, sheer boredom, uh, something to do, something to do with friends. Um, they thought that it was a very accessible and available substance. So when they spoke about this and they uh, talked a lot about the availability of cannabis in comparison to the availability of alcohol. They said it was a lot easier for them you know, to, to walk out of their house and, and to get cannabis from a friend or from someone on the street, uh, whereas if they were to try and go to a liquor store to buy alcohol because it was um, restricted by age, it was more challenging. So they perceived this substance to be particularly available, and they also thought that it was more acceptable. So a lot of them said that, you know, it's, it's very normalized. It doesn't really hold that stigma that it may have in past years. Um, they perceive that a lot of the individuals around them are uh, using cannabis. Whether or not that is true is a, is a different uh, topic for conversation. But their perception is that it's very acceptable, it's very normalized. They, another really interesting factor was that a lot of the youth felt that cannabis was a much healthier substance when compared to alcohol or prescription drugs. So oftentimes they would tell us um, something along the lines of, oh, well, I use cannabis to help uh, with my depression or with my anxiety, and I use it over prescription medication because I feel that it's um, doing less harms and it's, it's a little bit more of a healthier option. They are, also spoke about this in comparison to alcohol. So they would say, you know, I don't, I don't get a hangover from cannabis, whereas when I use alcohol, I have a hangover. Uh, I can even become ill or become sick from drinking too much, and for cannabis, that's never been an issue. So in their mind, um, it's, it's a much easier approach and a much healthier approach for them to, to use that particular substance. As previously mentioned, they are using cannabis um, for medical, physical, and uh, mental purposes. So a lot of youth are, are doing research and they're self-diagnosing um, depression and anxiety, uh, and then they're using cannabis to actually cope with those issues. Uh, they said that sometimes people use cannabis to deal with chronic pain, um, and that being largely associated with, uh, with cancer and arthritis. And we even heard from some youth that they are using cannabis to actually help with some eating disorders. So they felt that when they used uh, cannabis, it 
took away the, the stigma of eating, so it actually increased their appetite. A lot of youth would use the term uh, escape from reality as a reason for, for using cannabis. So they would cite reasons that it helps sleep or reduces stress and worry uh, as to why they are engaging in this particular substance use. So they had, ultimately they had a lot of reasons for, for why they uh, use cannabis. These are some quotes that we pulled directly from the qualitative research that, that we had done. And I won't read them uh, over because I, I want to focus on some of the, the later slides as we don't have a whole lot of time, but you guys will have access to these two to read them afterwards. They just speak to a lot of the misconceptions um, and how cannabis use is, is quite normalized in, in their communities. When we asked youth why they don't engage in cannabis use, they had many fewer reasons. Uh, a lot of these were fear of consequences, so whether their parents didn't approve or that there was a strong uh, legal presence, so, so they felt that they weren't able to engage in substance use or cannabis use without facing any legal repercussions. Some of them spoke to the actual physical harms that uh, particularly smoking cannabis can have. Uh, for example, lung cancer. They often associated this with uh, tobacco, so they know that there's largely uh, harms related to their respiratory system when using tobacco, and, and they've associated this to the, the use of cannabis smoking. Some youth actually spoke about how cannabis use changes a person. So when, when they say this, they were often referring to um, the actual presence of that person or, or their mental state. So they would often use an example of whether it be a past family member or a friend who became what they would call like really burnt out and wasn't all there um, mentally, so was a little bit absent. They, a lot of youth talked about how cannabis use actually triggered um, a mental illness or anxiety that they didn't know that they had predispositions to or that they um, weren't aware of before. So we actually interviewed some youth who said, you know, if I would have known that cannabis use would have caused this anxiety later in life, I would have never initiated use. And some youth even mentioned the fact that they abstain from using because they don't like the stigma associated with um, cannabis use. So they talked a lot about the terms um, like stoner and how they didn't want that to be a label for them. And then some youth actually mentioned that the use of cannabis was against their, their moral values or their intrinsic values. And again, this is a quote that we had uh, pulled directly from our, our report, and I'll, I'll leave that for, for you folks to take a gander at afterwards. So when we asked uh, youth about their understanding of the health effects of cannabis, a lot of them described um, the fact that they had heard some, some messaging around how cannabis can affect, uh, you know, the brain development or affect their, uh, their lungs, but a lot of them didn't necessarily care about them. Uh, they said that, okay, yeah, there are some, some negative effects, but marijuana affects everyone differently, so, you know, it, it might affect my friend John, but it, it doesn't affect me that same way. And oftentimes when, when we would talk about those long-term effects, those long-term health effects or those mental health effects, they would say, oh, you know, that's, that's later on in life. I, that doesn't necessarily apply to me right now, and that's only applicable to those who are using cannabis regularly or daily or lots of cannabis. So it doesn't apply to me because I only use, you know, maybe a gram every, every week. And this was really interesting because a lot of uh, them would describe, you know, the addictive properties of a substance, specifically cannabis, as to being based on an individual's personality. So they would say, oh, the, you know, cannabis itself isn't um, addictive, but it's the, the feeling that's addictive or that person has an addictive personality. It's not necessarily the substance. So it was really interesting to try and gain a better understanding of how youth perceived the effects of cannabis to be on, you know, the body, if it was an addictive substance or not. And they had many different beliefs on this. So 
So we know that our messaging around the health effects of cannabis are not necessarily resonating with youth. One of the other really interesting topics that we were able to discuss with them is their perceptions on cannabis and driving. And um, as we know, this, uh, this has been coming up a lot in the media lately. A lot of youth seem to have the misconception that cannabis makes them uh, a better driver. With that being said, they do think that cannabis affects everyone differently. And this is, um, you know, this also applies to the influence that it has on one's ability to drive. So we would often hear things like, um, I'm able to concentrate a lot better, you know, I, I don't speed, I really do think I'm a better driver. Some would cite the fact that it does slow their reaction time, um, but they don't necessarily think that this is evenly applied to everyone. They would often compare cannabis and its uh, effects on driving to the effects that alcohol has on driving. So they would say, oh, you know, cannabis isn't as dangerous as alcohol impaired driving. So this is a, a little concerning because alcohol should never be, um, you know, the, the standard. It should be sobriety. So we want youth to start thinking about, okay, cannabis um, and driving isn't as safe as so being sober and driving, not often comparing it to how alcohol affects their driving. And uh, the other thing that we found that was really interesting was that youth find it really difficult to be able to identify whether someone is impaired by cannabis or not. Um, and this is particularly important when we think about what an impaired driver looks like. So we know it's quite easy to determine if someone is impaired by alcohol, um, you know, slurred speech if, if they can't um, stand up straight, if they're having trouble walking. We know that that person is impaired by alcohol and it's a little bit easier for, for youth or for a friend to say, you know, we don't think you should be driving because look, you know, you can, you can hardly stand. But when it comes to cannabis, the, the effects on driving are, are different. So it's not always as easy to say, oh, you know, it might slow your reaction time or, you know, you affect your ability to divide attention because those aren't necessarily visible. So youth had a really difficult time identifying what a sober driver should look like when we're talking about uh, cannabis impaired drivers. And as mentioned, when we asked them about the effects that cannabis has on brain development, a lot of them had heard this message, but they didn't necessarily understand why it affected the brain, which was concerning because we know that it does have major effects on your prefrontal uh, cortex before it's um, fully developed. But a lot of youth couldn't actually touch on these points and, and how it affects uh, their brain development. So these messages didn't necessarily deter youth amongst this age group. And again, when we were asking about the um, effects that cannabis has um, with regards to addiction, uh, they often cited the fact that they didn't necessarily believe it was the, the drug that was addictive, but that, that feeling. Um, one thing that was really interesting when we were having these conversations is that youth would be describing withdrawal symptoms. So they would say things like, oh, you know, when my, my aunt Joanne uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, smoke a joint, she gets really cranky, um, but then once she, you know, uses cannabis, she's actually calmed down quite a bit. So they would be describing these withdrawal symptoms, but not necessarily associating those symptoms with the fact that there was an absence of using that substance. So that was really interesting to us, the fact that they don't necessarily think that the drug itself is addictive, but then they would be describing what a withdrawal symptom would look like. But some youth did mention the fact that they thought cannabis was uh, addictive, and as this uh, quote pulls out, it'll, it'll talk about um, trying to come down off, off of the substance, and, and you know, they, they think that it's not as significant as coming down off something like cocaine or heroin. It's more of that mental barrier. We also asked youth how they typically use the substance. And this was really interesting um, because it spoke to some of the messages that they have been hearing with regards to tobacco and the effects that smoking cannabis has on your respiratory system. 
So although they are using other forms of cannabis like shatter and, um, and dabs and poppers, they are changing the ways in which they are using cannabis. So a lot of them cited the fact that they are baking it now rather than smoking it because they're trying to avoid those, um, those harms and those effects on their lungs and on their respiratory system. They also mentioned that cannabis can be uh, drank in a, in a tea or an alcoholic beverage. And those are just some other uh, terms listed on, on this slide that, uh, that came out throughout these focus groups. This was a really interesting conversation that, that we were able to engage youth in, um, especially given all of the media attention around the legalization of cannabis. So we asked youth whether or not they felt um, if legalizing cannabis was the proper approach for, for Canada to take. And they had some really interesting views and opinions on this topic. Um, as it stands, they, they felt that cannabis was um, certain, certain amounts of cannabis were, were legal right now. They weren't necessarily uh, aware of the legal status. Um, some of them were often confused by what was happening in Canada right now with marijuana. You know, they're hearing from various um, audiences, whether it be their parents, their teachers, or, or their community police officers, that, that marijuana is illegal, but then they were confused because they know that marijuana for medicinal purposes is actually legal. So they found this to be a little bit confusing, especially given the um, prevalence of dispensaries that are popping up across the country, they, they felt that if they're being told that you shouldn't be using cannabis or you shouldn't um, be allowed to because it's illegal, but then they see a marijuana shop uh, on their corner, they didn't, they didn't really understand why there was so much conflicting information out there. So when we spoke about the, the pros of uh, cannabis legalization, we talked a lot about how this would regulate the, the current substances that um, are out there. It would, um, you know, reduce the black market. And a lot of them suggested that the sales that we would receive from, from the tax could go back into education or that through the legalization of cannabis, we would actually increase the tourism to our country. Uh, when we talked about the, the negative effects or the cons of cannabis legalization, a lot of them mentioned that they would be concerned that uh, drug dealers would be pushing harder drugs, and when they reference harder drugs, they are referring to drugs um, such as like cocaine or, or heroin. They would also be restricting the age limit, so they felt that the age limit would be a barrier. And then they were concerned about the profits going to the government, and they were also concerned about the um, THC levels being lowered if it was uh, made legal. So we thought that it'd be really important to touch on how cannabis is portrayed in, um, in the media and in social media. And a lot of them said that there's much information out there, that it's inconsistent, um, and that it's, it's biased. So they felt that it was really challenging for them at the current um, time to be able to decipher through what's evidence-informed or what's val um, validated online. They spoke a lot about, about this and how it is um, expressed on online, whether it's on, you know, social media platforms like Facebook or Snapchat, or if it's in music videos or in movies, how it's very much normalized and, and seems like it's not that big of a deal. Um, when we asked them about their views on enforcement, they said a lot of the times when they've come into contact with enforcement that they would be let off with a warning and that the police had more important things to focus on. And especially around drug-impaired driving, um, they said that they had never really heard of many uh, crashes or people getting charged with driving under the influence related to cannabis. When we asked about what they would suggest for future prevention efforts, a lot of the conversation was around um, a non-biased, non-judgmental conversation with parents or, or youth allies. And we'll talk a lot more about this in the second and, and third series of these webinars. But they wanted more harm reduction approaches, uh, not a just say no or a, a preachy conversation. And they felt that they should be receiving both the positive and negative effects of cannabis, not just the potential harm, harms that cannabis has. 
And they also felt that cannabis um, prevention efforts should be starting a lot earlier in age and should have consistent follow-up. It shouldn't just be a one-time assembly or a one-time presentation from a police officer in their classroom. So they want more information. They're hungry for the information. So what this is, uh, what this has implications for prevention for is, is actually what uh, Dan is going to be speaking to on, on how he talks about cannabis and the effects that cannabis has to youth. So I'll, I'll skip over these slides because he'll be able to provide more practical examples as he does this on a, on a daily basis. And as, and as mentioned, we want to be in, in increasing the availability of evidence-informed resources for, for parents and educators. We know that there are a lot of conversations around this topic currently happening, and what we want to focus on is um, increasing those critical thinking skills among youth. So we want to be able to provide youth with the necessary information for them to make an evidence-informed decision, whether that be to use sociably or you know, to, to abstain from use. We want to ensure that they have all of the information that they need. And through doing this, we want to be able to create those, you know, those social service pathways for access to support services and that continuum of care. So these are some projects that CCSA is working on. And as we move towards the regulation of cannabis, we believe that this viewpoint from youth has implications for policy. We think it's really important to take youth perceptions and, and perspective into consideration and incorporate this into our education, prevention, treatment, and enforcement efforts. One thing that did come out of these focus groups was the need for that harm reduction material. So a lot of youth want to know, you know, what they can use or how much they can use that would um, reduce the, the harms of cannabis use, so something like a low-risk cannabis um, guideline. And I just wanted to quickly mention that because we only had 77 youth, this study does have some limitations, particularly related to our sample size. It's not meant to be a representation of all Canadian youth. And um, we weren't able, because it's qualitative research and it was a small sample size, we weren't able to provide jurisdictional differences or differences amongst um, gender or age. And we did have an over-representation over of youth from Alberta and Ontario. So in conclusion, um, this research speaks to the need for an increased awareness of um, the, the evidence and particularly in how it relates to the positive and negative effects of cannabis. It's really challenging to only focus on the negative effects of cannabis when we do have this whole medicinal field and um, body of evidence. So youth want both sides of that information. And we want to be able to have targeted prevention efforts. So we know that different age groups, um, different messages resonate better with different age groups. So we think that targeted prevention efforts and health promotion should also do the same. And as cannabis regulation changes, we also feel that education should be proactive and we want to just get ahead, ahead of the curve and, and start that health promotion and prevention before the actual uh, legalization and regulation of cannabis. So that is uh, all for me and I'm going to now hand it over to Daniel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Katie, and thanks everyone for having me. Uh, I am Daniel Bacom, and I am a rehabilitation counselor with the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba. The Addictions Foundation of Manitoba is a crown agency that's uh, committed to being, uh, to working with people who struggle with addictions issues across the province. We have over 400 staff and provide a, a wide range of services uh, through about 28 locations across the province. I work in the school-based program, which is a program that uh, was started several years ago where a counselor works directly with school divisions and uh, will work in that school division to both do education prevention work and also to do assessments on young people who have uh, alcohol or drug related issues. I do both in the Hanover School Division providing counseling services assessment and prevention services. Uh, as Katie mentioned, the messaging on cannabis has not uh, really been effective with youth for a while. Uh, there's a lot of 
perceptions that youth have about cannabis that are incorrect or are uh, biased and affected by their consumption of media and what they can see their their friends doing and what they can see in movies and the perception of cannabis overall is generally very positive in social media and pop culture these days. So what we need, uh, we believe, is some new messaging and new ways to communicate facts and research. So what we'll be doing today, for my part, is uh, trying to achieve three goals. And this presentation that I'm uh, presenting to you is an excerpt from one of the presentations that I do with young people. And I do around 50 classroom presentations a year to high school students. This presentation has been removed from that and is tailored as a standalone PowerPoint. It will be able to be used by anybody, any of you, when presenting to a youth audience talking about alcohol and drugs, but specifically cannabis. So today the three goals are to understand how the brain works, to understand what makes teenage brains special, and to understand what alcohol and drugs do to teenage brains. So keep in mind that this presentation is typically given to young people, and uh, it's tailored for that audience. So right at the very beginning, we need to talk about brains. When I'm talking to a youth audience, this is my icebreaker slide, I like to open up with some humor, pointing out that the brain is amazingly complex and several areas uh, are identified on the slide. This part does stuff up here. This is a parietal lobe. It's a visual center. We use it for facial recognition and uh, processing visual input. This part down here, it does other stuff. It's pointing at the brainstem, which regulates breathing and heart rate. And right there at the front, that part does lots of stuff. That is the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for judgment and reason. I say probably at this point because this area is not fully developed yet during the teen years. I often explain this area of the brain to teens as the voice of your mother telling you that what you're about to do is a bad idea. This area does not fully develop until adulthood, which to those of you who have teenage children is no surprise. Since you're all very experienced social workers, I'm sure that the fact that this area is under development is something you've experienced, something you've seen among the young people that you work with. And when I talk to youth about it, they can generally acknowledge that, yes, you know, we, we do make decisions without thinking sometimes. And they have an understanding that they're a work in progress. Now, I used a few uh, pretty large words there, like parietal lobe and prefrontal cortex. Those are pretty large words for a youth audience. Brains are very complicated. We don't know everything about them. Uh, what I try to communicate when I'm talking to young people is the, is the science, but in a way that they can understand it. Because the stuff that we do know about the brain is hard to explain. The, the neurological studies and research that have been done are difficult to translate for other professionals, let alone lay people, and especially for youth. So what I use is an analogy, and I describe that to young people as a word picture, uh, which describes how brains work and what makes teenage brains special. This analogy I'm presenting is one that I developed for use in the Hanover School Division. I developed it about five years ago to replace presentation materials that were out of date and a bit out of touch and hard for young people to understand. Well, today we're focusing on cannabis. This analogy works with all drugs and alcohol across the board. So the analogy is this. Brains are like cities. This is a picture of Seoul, South Korea, and it's a beautiful city. If you see a map of it from above, it actually looks an awful lot like a brain, which is why I think that this city traffic model analogy of explaining addiction is, uh, is pretty ideal for young people. So how are brains like cities? Well, just like a city, a brain has different areas that are responsible for different tasks. So you might have an area that's responsible for language, an area responsible for movement, an area responsible for memory or emotions or uh, doing math or or doing complex tasks with small machines. There's also roads that connect to different areas. And the brain has the ability to change itself based on needs or activities. And cities are exactly the same. Cities have different areas responsible for different things. Areas that are shopping centers or residential centers. They also have roads that connect to different areas. And based on what the needs of the citizens in a city are, the city will change to respond. The most important part of the analogy is talking about neural pathways. 
Neural pathways are the roads that connect different areas of our brain. They allow signals to travel back and forth to help us think, to reason, to recall, and to feel. They grow and change depending on which areas we use together. For example, hand-eye coordination is a statement that you've probably heard before. What this means is that when you use two areas of your brain together, you're making a pathway or a road or a connection between them. So when we do hand-eye coordination activities when we're playing sports, when we're playing video games. We are strengthening the pathway between our visual cortex and our hands. That means that what starts off as a small connection, uh, maybe a small dirt road, can slowly grow until it's a highway or a freeway, and the signals will travel much faster and much more effectively. This isn't just with hand-eye coordination, but there's many areas of the brain that function concurrently. Uh, you may have heard the expression scent, the sense of smell is tied to memory. And it's true, which is why when you're walking somewhere and you, you smell a smell that you used to smell, maybe it's a, a smell of a flower or, a, or a, a barbecue, or maybe it's the smell of your old high school girlfriend or boyfriend's perfume or cologne, you'll have those memories come flooding back of when you were a kid or a young person. That's because those two areas of the brain have a very strong pathway. So the development of those pathways is part of what's happening during the teenage years. We have to talk about why teenage brains are so special. And they're special because they're under construction. This is an analogy that is very easy for young people to understand. It. You explain to them that their brains are like cities made out of clay. They're very malleable and easy to change. We've all played with Play-Doh before. I don't know if I've ever met a young person who didn't play with Play-Doh at one point in their life. And you know how easy it is to build things out of Play-Doh, how easy it is to make changes if you had a city built out of clay in front of you. You could very easily build up the areas that you have. You could very easily add to them or build more connections between them. It's very easy during the teen years to build up those new areas and the pathways in the brain through learning. For example, languages or music or sports skills. That's why the teen years are so important for brain development. That's why right now when they're in school, when they're exploring their hobbies and their interests, it's such an important task for them. They're better now at learning than they ever have been or ever will be again. I often explain it to young people like this. They have superpowers. I tell them, you have superpowers. Not cool ones like turning invisible, but you have learning powers. And your learning powers enable you to be uh, much better at an adult at learning and growing and changing. The problem with this is that it makes our brains very vulnerable to negative change. Remember, when we use different areas of the brain together, they become linked. The pathways that connect them get stronger. And I can draw an analogy here. have got to remember with hand-eye coordination, this is why most young people are better at video games than their dads are. They're able to grow those pathways quicker. Our brains don't always know what a negative change is and sometimes can allow unhealthy connections to develop. Katie mentioned this earlier, youth who are using alcohol or drugs to deal with depression or mental illness, to help sleep, to reduce stress, to escape from reality. The problem is that when we use alcohol or drugs, when we're distressed or depressed, struggling with symptoms of mental illness, feeling the effects of trauma, or even just having a rough day, we're actually teaching our brains to make a connection between feeling bad and using alcohol or drugs to feel better. Now, this connection can be small at first, but there's very few things in the world that are as effective at making you feel better when you're having a bad day than cannabis. It makes you feel better. That's something that we have to acknowledge when we're talking to young people. Yeah, this, is gonna, this, this might make you feel better. It's not good for you. It will bring other problems along with it, but we have to acknowledge. We understand it makes you feel better. And when they use it to feel better, they make a small pathway, just a dirt road at first. But the next time they feel bad, they want to use again and again. And the more they use those uh, substances, the more they use cannabis to feel better when they're having a bad day, the stronger that pathway becomes. I think most of us have used Google Maps to get from A to B when we're driving. Uh, if you're anything like me, you get lost a lot in cities and you have to pull over, pull out your phone and figure out where the heck you are. Well, During times of stress, our brains will look for solutions. Our brains are always trying to find the best way to, to solve the problems that we face. And the signals will travel down those well-used pathways. Our brains are actually able to identify the quickest and easiest path 
to feeling better, just like with Google Maps. If you've ever used it before, you know that you input a destination that you want to get to, and it'll search through the roads, and it'll give you some options for how to get there. And you can see I've got a map on the screen of some options for a trip that I was going to take. And there's a few options that are grayed out. It will tell you, okay, you could take this path, which is going to take you this long. You could take this path, which will take you a little bit less. But this blue path, the path that identifies as the quickest, that's the best path, and that's the one that you should take. And almost always will we take that path. Our brains are the same. When we're feeling bad, when we're feeling depressed, when we're having a bad day, when our parents don't get off our backs, we feel stressed and our brains look for a way to reduce this feeling. And it'll tell you, oh, well, you could go talk to your friends or you could take a walk or you know, take a nap or, or have a bath or heck, even eat some ice cream. But the fastest way to feeling better is going to be using drugs. When we identify alcohol or drugs as the quickest path in our brains, we experience this as a craving. This is a very easy way for young people to understand how addiction develops because it utilizes technology that they're familiar with and and activities that they are going to have engaged with quite a bit. Now, that's a teenage brain. What about an adult brain? Well, as we enter our early 20s, our brains start to harden. We no longer have cities in our heads made out of clay, but they're made out of concrete. Learning and changing, while still possible, becomes more difficult. This is why you have that expression, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can still learn when you're older. Uh, That's why we're all here, to learn. But it's a little bit harder. Our brains don't adapt quite as quickly. We don't build up new pathways quite as quickly. And the pathways that we've already created are solidified and they're harder to change. This means that the habits we've started are harder to break and our cravings are now hardwired our alcohol and drug use is harder to stop. This is what dependency with drugs and alcohol looks like. This is how it develops. And explaining it to young people, using an analogy that they can understand, is a lot better and more effective, I've found, than than moralizing, than coming down and saying, we got to have a right and wrong. Especially considering where most young people are getting their information from these days, uh, which is the internet or their friends, we don't want to get into an argument with them. We want to start talking about how to communicate science to them effectively. So what should we do? And this applies both to young people that I'm talking to in the classroom presentations and to us here in this webinar. We need to understand how addiction develops. And we can use the city traffic model to do that. We also need to be aware of the reasons why we're using. And when I'm talking to young people, both in the classroom presentations and in one-on-one sessions, I'm always looking for the why. And many of them will say, I'm using because I'm bored. I'm using because um, I'm just trying to have fun. And okay, a lot of them are using because of that. But if they're developing problems from their use, if they're finding it hard to quit or cut back, then I'm, I'm really curious where those pathways have been developed and, and where they've made those connections in their brain. And in the next webinar, I'll talk a bit more about that. We also need to seek healthy ways to deal with stress and problems in our lives. And for young people, that is the that is the magic bullet. If we can get them connected to using things like exercise or sports or hobbies, uh, to deal with their stress, if we can teach them to talk out their problems before they just rely on a substance, then we're giving them skills and tools that are going to be lifelong and and extremely helpful. We also need to talk to them about delaying the use of alcohol and cannabis until our brains have a chance to fully develop. And I say 21 plus years old, but that will be uh, to be determined by the federal government when they decide how old the the cannabis age will be when they have legalized cannabis. And we'll discuss this more in the second webinar, but I I try to stay away from moralizing. I try to stay away from saying, you know, you need to promise me you're never going to use cannabis in your life. But we talk about how to delay cannabis use until later in life. We know that the longer someone takes to start using cannabis, the less likely they are to have problems with it. So that's why we're pushing for the delaying of use and That is something that is a bit easier for you to hear from us as opposed to just saying we want you to consider not using at all. So that's the analogy. That's the presentation that we've developed. And it's been effective 
over the last uh, several years I've used it. And when I discuss it with youth afterwards, and I have handouts for them, and I have um, one-on-one conversations with them afterwards. When I discuss it with youth, they've gotten very good feedback about how it's understandable for them and uh, is accessible at their level. So thank you for listening. That's my piece. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, there's been a couple comments uh, here as you go along that the uh, city traffic model is something that uh, is really uh, is really uh, well, basic people saying that they're loving it. Um, and uh, I am sure your uh, uh, your students uh, get a, a great education because I know in this last uh, 15, 20 minutes, uh, I've learned a lot uh, from you and I've also learned a lot from Katie uh, in the sense of youth's perception as well. So uh, now it's time to move to the question and answer uh, portion. Uh, and uh, if you do have any questions, please, now is the time to type in. We have uh, about 13 minutes uh, to get to all your questions. I have uh, a few up here right now. Um, and uh, one, of, uh, one of the questions, just to get the housekeeping out of the way, uh, the handouts for the youth available to see. The, uh, the PowerPoint of this presentation will be uploaded to the CSW website uh, as well as the recording. So all of that uh, will be accessible. Um, so just, I think, to, to begin off, uh, I have a few questions going, uh, but one of the questions I had um, as listening to Katie's uh, presentation is, um, is there any comparisons to how uh, youth think about cannabis compared to what adults think about it? So uh, the, you have this qualitative study with youth. Is there a comparable one uh, it is to adults at this point? Hi, uh, not to not to my knowledge, nothing that CCSA has um, previously undertaken. But we, this uh, starting in April, we are going to be running focus groups with adults on their perceptions on cannabis impaired driving. So it's not directly just focusing on cannabis as um, as a substance. It's a little bit more specific and related to driving. But some of the questions that we have included in our discussion guide are going to be around whether they feel that they have the necessary education to have these discussions with youth and really try to gain a better understanding of, of their knowledge and awareness on the topic. So that is a report that we will probably be pu publishing um, next, next fiscal, next year. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, you said that uh, Canada is one of the highest uses of cannabis among youth in the world. Uh, why is that, I guess, comparative? Uh, and another person had wrote it as uh, compared to other populations. Why, why is there any evidence on why youth um, uh, use more in Canada? Um, no, like uh, not, not particularly related to why Canada would have uh, higher use than, than other population areas. But one of the studies that, um, that we did reference in our report speaks to what I spoke about at the, the beginning of the presentation, how perceived risk affects one's likelihood of using a substance. So as the perceived risk goes down, the likelihood of use goes up. So that is um, a report that was uh, cited in our actual technical resource. Um, I could find the citation and uh, send it out to participants afterwards. That's sort of a best explanation for, for why it's a uh, higher use and it, it could be related to youth perception of risk. No worries. Thank you very much. This one's for Daniel. This is a great presentation, great analogies. Uh, are the hardening effects on the pathways the same for alcohol compared to cannabis? Sorry, that was the, are the hardening effects the same? I think the, getting to the, uh, the traffic model, getting, I think the question right. is trying to get to that pathway that you had spoken about, uh, using more of mm -hmm. the stronger path, the strengths of the pathways. Uh, if you, mm -hmm. is, is it the, uh, is the evidence bear out that it's the same for alcohol as it is for cannabis, or is one higher than the other in the sense of creating a stronger pathway? Well, for any drug that affects the reward pathway in the brain, there's going to be a similar effect, and different drugs will be more or less effective at um, at reducing that stress, because that's what it's about. That's what creates the connection is the, re the stress reduction or the reduction of the depressive feelings. And cannabis is especially effective at reducing depressive feelings uh, in the short term, not necessarily in the long term. Alcohol does... A, pretty decent job of it as well, as do many of the harder illicit drugs and some pharmaceuticals. 
um, the brain pathways hardening afterwards and kind of becoming more set, that's a, pro that's a natural process of uh, the brain's development. So if you've created a pathway between, you know, you're having a bad day or you're having lots of stress and anxiety, and then you use any substance to feel better, that pathway is going gonna, is gonna to remain. And you do see some people who gravitate more towards one substance than the other. Um, I think one of the reasons why cannabis is very popular for this is because of the public perception of it as, as healthy or as at least acceptable and uh, because it seems to um, impact people who are having depressive feelings so, so strongly. The unfortunate piece for, with that is that in the long run, it actually makes the brain weaker at dealing with depression. So if they decide, I don't want to use cannabis for my depression anymore, their brain is a little bit weaker at dealing with it. Thank you. I think this one could be answered by either of you. Uh, is there any evidence that either boys or girls experience more negative outcomes from uh, cannabis or marijuana use? Um, from the from the research that um, we have done in the statistics out there, males have um, higher usage rates, but uh, we don't have any evidence on what like whether or not um, they're more susceptible. Okay, uh, Daniel, anything to add on that one? No, if I'll not, defer to Katie's with them on this. The next one, we got tons to get in. Uh, the impression I got from the first presentation was that you seem to be asking for enough accurate information from reliable sources so they can make better informed choices regarding cannabis, cannabis use. In, relace, in relation to informed choice comment, is that recommendation being made to policymakers and government who are engaging in the legalization uh, process for cannabis? Yes, certainly. A lot of our... I, I saw it on the um, on the Q and A slide there. So we we actually did present our uh, findings to um, various number of ministers' offices, and, and our recommendations have certainly gone forward. One of the projects that uh, Anna, my call, my research colleague, and I, who um, conducted the data collection, uh, are working on is is trying to in increase um, digital literacy among youth. So when I say digital literacy, I mean uh, their ability to evaluate information online, whether that be on uh, the internet through an article or in a in a movie or what they see on on Facebook, so trying to equip them with uh, the necessary skills to validate uh, information. With that being said, we are going to be creating some some resources that will be uh, youth uh, consulted and youth led uh, that would provide more of that accurate evidence informed lens, but also taking into consideration the type of information that youth want to be receiving, so not necessarily focusing on, you know, oh, these are the health effects that they could have on your brain, something more in line with what um, Daniel presented that's more digestible and tailored for that specific audience. Excellent. Thank you very much. A um, uh, question for me, what has, uh, and it's uh, going to be framed in two, two ways, I think. What, what has contributed to the reduction of stigma of cannabis in Canada? And reframed in another way, what do you think uh, is the biggest contribut contributor to the normalization of cannabis use? use? Uh, just speaking, if it's okay if I step on this one, Katie, just speaking to the, the second part of the question, what's contributing to the normalizing? Um, it's not hard to look at the movies that have come out in the last few years to see a movie that is all about people who are smoking cannabis and having a great time. Uh, anything with Seth Rogen or uh, James Franco and a number of movies that are all about people who are just being high and having fun. Uh, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle is a bit of an older example, but that's from when I was younger. And there's um, there's a number of, of movies and television shows and, and, and media out there where the only consequences of smoking cannabis are just having a really good time. And that's, I think, partially contributing to it. Um, and I've had young people say to me, well, look, like, look at all these famous people who are smoking. There's Snoop Dogg, there's Seth Rogen, there's, and they give me these long lists of people who, um, who are using and are very famous and obviously wealthy and doing quite well for themselves. Um, and uh, not really realizing that those are, sure, those are famous people who are rich and doing quite well who also happen to smoke cannabis, but that's not 
smoking cannabis isn't how they got there necessarily, and not everybody who smokes cannabis becomes a millionaire and famous. So I think that's part of it, at least from what I've been hearing. Okay, excellent. Uh, Katie, any, uh, anything bearing up from the evidence on your side? I would just say a lot of it is is mostly associated to to those um, perceptions. And if we look to our neighbors in the south, many of the states have um, legalized cannabis over the past several years, and and this really plays into you know the normalization of the substance. Um, when we see big states like uh, Colorado, Washington, and California legalizing recreational marijuana use, that's certainly going to play um, a role in in how we're perceiving the the substance. Uh, and I think just these social political conversations around cannabis, um, particularly around the last election, that has certainly not necessarily normalized cannabis use, but it's opened the doors for those conversations to take place. And as mentioned, a lot of youth um, perceive the presence of these dispensaries and, and cannabis shops. Um, those, those too influence their, their perceptions, and, and it is normalizing behavior. Uh, so I would say that those play a significant role in, in how it's become normalized. With regards to the stigma associated with cannabis use, it's, it's challenging to, to touch on that. Um, I think that cannabis use has definitely differed from, the stigma associated with cannabis users has definitely uh, differs from the, the stigma associated with um, someone who might be using uh, cocaine or heroin. So, so that too needs to be taken into consideration when we when we think about using the word uh, reduction in, reduction in stigma. But hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Now, uh, Daniel said that the uh, presentations being delivered to youth in Manitoba have been effective, uh, and the question is, uh, what have they been effective in achieving? So my assumption is they're looking at uh, have you followed uh, with any evidence of any change in behavior f based on your uh, presentations to the classes. Well, unfortunately, I don't have the same kind of uh, research available that uh, Katie's brought, which is really great to see and to hear again. Um, what I can uh, what I can tell you is that of the seven years I've been working in the school division and uh, working with these presentations, we when we started, we had presentations that were a little older and a little more uh, based on older science and not as youth friendly and. Um, Having youth engagement with those presentations was uh, it, it wasn't happening. You know, they would they would listen and then they would kind of walk out of the classroom and that would be that. With these presentations, we're seeing a, I've been seeing a lot more uh, engagement during the classrooms, a lot more youth talking about it, a lot more youth staying behind to talk about it afterwards. And when I follow up with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, they express how it was easier for them to understand and uh, how they are, it's, it's caused some to consider, some who maybe wouldn't be considering changing otherwise, to consider delaying their use until they're an adult. It's communicated the message of brain development and delaying use more effectively than I think we were able to before. Perfect. Uh, this one is for you, Katie. Um, someone has asked, uh, how old uh, is the youngest youth in your focus groups uh, reported to use cannabis? And then I'll also uh, combine that. Was, was there any obvious differences in the data, data that you received from rural versus city populations? So the youngest uh, youth that we had in our focus groups that reported uh, cannabis use was 14. Um, and speaking to the obvious differences in data from rural versus city populations, as I mentioned, it's really hard to break down qualitative data by um, population difference when, when I speak about rural and urban areas um, because the sample size was so small, we don't want to single out any, um, any individuals who might have uh, taken who might have participated in our focus groups. But one of the biggest sort of main themes I can speak to is that um, you know quantitative data shows, that there are higher rates of use, of cannabis use in rural areas. Um, and when we speak to things like uh, perceptions on impaired driving and um, presence of enforcement, being in rural areas, these things are, are often not as, um, they don't have such a heavily, heavy presence as they do in those um, more urban areas. CCSA does also have a um, report looking at rural versus urban um, substance use among students. 
so that can get more into detail on the differences amongst those populations. Um, it's not specifically related to cannabis, but it does speak about uh, substance use among students, so that is available on our website. And I can send that, um, that link to you, Fred, to share with participants as well. Perfect. Uh, this will be the last question because we're right at, at the end of our time here. Uh, and I'm just going to try to combine two. So based on the evidence or science, is there any safe level of cannabis used to reduce the harm of developing brain? And then I'm going to combine it with what percentage, percentage of teen users end up having significant problems due to their cannabis use. Uh, use. Um, so this will be the last kind of combined question, and uh, either one of you can take it on. So I'll speak to the so I'll speak to the first one. So with regards to um, low risk cannabis uh, guidelines, uh, CAMH, which is an organization based in um, Ontario, is actually in the process of updating the literature around this. So they are developing these low risk cannabis um, guidelines, and they had published a previous version, but they are updating it as evidence as is emerging. And with regards to the second question, um, we know that it's about one in nine um, individuals who start uh, cannabis at a younger age develop a um, cannabis use disorder. So this evidence is coming out of our Substance Abuse in Canada report that came out uh, two years ago. And again, I can send a link to this. It's um, the effects of cannabis on the um, adolescent brain. So it gets into the effect that um, heavy uh, chronic cannabis use at an earlier age can have on you later in life. Um, but with regards to like specifically related to the brain development issue, uh, I, would, I would have to go back and review the literature on that. Excellent. Any final uh, thoughts from you, Daniel? Uh, no, Last just I agree, no with, uh, what, I agree with what Katie was saying. And um, a lot of the uh, – I, I don't have any specific research data to present on that second question. I wish I did. Um, and uh, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence, but as we all know, the plural of anecdote is not data. So um, I'm, I'm cautious to kind of uh, weigh in too heavily there, but I definitely agree with what Katie is saying. And, and uh, I think this is another area where more research is needed. And one of the challenges is how are you going to how are you going to gather some of that data? If we're going to try to gather data about school outcomes from young people, are we going to try to gather that from youth who are in school? Well, a lot of the young people that uh, I've worked with and that I've tried to work with are people who are struggling to attend school because of their cannabis use. And how do you access them to, to glean some data? So that's a challenge, I think. And there's going to be several challenges for anybody who's trying to uncover a bit more specifics about this research. And, and just Excellent. going well, off of you know, what... I was, our time's up right now, and I'd really like to take the opportunity to thank uh, each and every one of, you, uh, one of those in the audience today for sending in your questions, for listening to get today. And I apologize if I was unable to get to your questions uh, due to the time restraints. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to again thank Katie and Daniel uh, for lending their time and their expertise to presenting today. And I'm certain all in the audience are looking forward to the next webinars in this series scheduled for March 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, again, please note that a recording of this, PowerPoint, of this presentation and the PowerPoint will be up on the uh, CSW web website in the near future as well as those for the attended uh, 45 minutes or more of this presentation, a confirmation of attendance will be sent directly to you for those that were, want to put it forward for continuing education for their regulatory requirements. Uh, and uh, finally, there is a short survey uh, that uh, if you take the opportunity to fill out, it would be uh, go a long way to helping us to uh, uh, better inform our continuing education offerings in the future. So until next time, thank you again, Katie and Daniel, and uh, have a great National Social Work Month. Thank you, and take care.